So what then makes for a successful business? We've talked a lot in terms of markets and the distinction between market systems and political systems, but let's bring it back to some really basic issues of what actually makes for a successful business. Well, like so many things in life, it's often easier to identify the sources of failure, why things fail, rather than why things succeed. But we can kind of reverse engineer the failures to figure out what actually makes for the successes. Um, as I say in, my, in the, uh, the short slide module here, um, some really basic things like finding a place in the market, uh, your own distinctive position in the market, uh, and then make sure that customers can find you. So your place in the market is going to relate to price, it's going to relate to product attributes, uh, but then of course customers have to be able to find you and there'll be a lot more to say about that in the coming weeks uh, and how you actually put yourself out there in front of customers and how do you win a positive reputation. So a simple summary point of course is that you have to identify the gap in the market okay so a successful business finds a gap in the market that's not being met by others and does its best to uh, own that gap as it were you should identify either a latent demand uh, some demand that's out there potentially but which no one is taking advantage of uh, either people haven't just simply recognized that there is a, a need out there. A very interesting and fundamental point. Customers are not good about talking to the needs that they have that have never been met or never been defined by a company that can meet those needs. So if you go and ask customers, what do you want? Uh, they will pretty much describe the products that are already on offer in the market to meet the uh, needs that have already been recognized by the market. But if you can identify some what's often called pain point or point of frustration for customers in their day-to-day -day lives or in something they'd like to do but haven't been able to do, to offer a new product or a new service that enables them to have a smoother, simpler day, week, year, then you're unlocking a latent demand, a demand that was there but which had not been activated by either the customers or people um, looking to serve them on the uh, supply side. Of course, the alternative is to just get into the market selling an existing product, um, but to do it in a way which makes uh, for a higher level of customer satisfaction. And you may do it cheaper, you may do it quicker, you may uh, simply do it in a place where it hasn't been done before. So you may take rather ordinary Japanese food and deliver it to people in a place who would like Japanese food and haven't been able to get it up to now. If you want to get rich quickly, uh, a really simple way to do it is to go and sell pretty ordinary Japanese food to people in a remote place. For example, people working in a mine in a remote part of Australia or um, uh, up in, uh, say, um, northern Norway in the aquaculture towns, you know, where people are uh, uh, breeding salmon, uh, farming salmon to sell to the world at large. They would love to eat Japanese food, but no one's ever thought to come there and actually sell it to them. And of course, they have very high incomes in places like that. So there are a lot of people who make their money going out of the way, uh, bringing well-recognized popular products to people who haven't been able to get it before, particularly uh, services such as, such as cuisine. So you have to be either prepared to go to the customers or if you want to stay in the comforts of the big city where there is intense competition, you're going to have to find either a new need to be met or a new way to meet an existing need. Okay? So, of course, you also have to have customers understand that they have the need for the product and that your business can satisfy their need. So there's some key, key challenges there. So there are some basic questions that uh, can help you get to uh, an understanding of whether there is a potential for what you can offer. Is someone else doing this business? If not, why not? 
And here's where business and economics tend to diverge as uh, academic views of the world. There's a uh, very famous anecdote or a story about uh, the uh, academic economist professor who lives in the world of a theory of perfect markets and believes that whenever a need is not, need is not met, naturally an entrepreneurial response arises and that need is very quickly met. So the old, the old joke really is, is that the old academic professor of economics is walking along with the young graduate student and the student says, Professor, look, there's a $50 bill on the ground. Someone's dropped 50 bucks. And the professor says, impossible. If it was a real $50 bill, somebody would already have picked it up. Now, of course, the business academic recognizes that mark markets are imperfect. $50 bills are left lying around to be picked up by people who are quick to pick them up. And we will talk about this later on when we talk about entrepreneurship. We'll look at the work, for example, of a scholar called Israel Kurtzner, whose idea, whose concept is that businesses are often established and uh, successfully run by people who show entrepreneurial alertness, who are quicker to see the opportunities than others. Okay, They see the 50 buck bill and pick it up before other people see it. And they certainly don't succumb to a theoretical notion that all the opportunities in the world were already taken advantage of. Because of course, how did we get here? Um, economies are dynamic. It's always opportunity out there if people are alert to the opportunity. So if in fact there is already someone doing the business, okay, um, that doesn't mean you should walk away. There are a huge number of um, ramen stores in Tokyo in some uh, places, under some conditions, there are room for more ramen shops, okay? Uh, if that wasn't the case, Ippudo would never have come from Kyushu to Tokyo and now be one of the main players here in Tokyo. So is there room in the market for another? Now, the room in the market may in fact be made by yourself. You may nudge somebody else out. And the history of ramen shops along Waseda Dori is quite a sad one. So many ramen stores have come, uh, they've set up their Waseda branch, so many have left, Ippudo continues, several other prominent ones continue there. Now, they make a good product and uh, they have good service, so that's one of the reasons why they've survived. There are some other reasons uh, why other uh, quite good ramen stores have failed along Waseda Dori in the, the years past. And uh, we'll talk about that later on, actually, as an anecdote. So a way to think about whether you can make room in the market, even a crowded market, is what value proposition do you offer to customers? This notion of value proposition is, I think, a very useful one, not just for thinking about business, but for thinking about yourself as an employee. What value do I offer to a potential employer? So when we think about self-education, self-development, we should think about how we can increase the value that we offer as a proposition to a potential employer, to a potential customer, and always be focused on the value proposition. The world does not owe us a living, is an old expression in English. This notion of value proposition reminds us that we are the ones who have to propose the value to the people who are going to pay us, either a salary or um, as a customer, if we're going to be establishing a business. So you need to show your value proposition. Um, you need the customers to find you, to trust you, and then to commit. And actually getting people to commit to the sale is a challenge. Now, it's not good enough to have a great product. Uh, and to be able to communicate it and get customers to commit. You actually actually have to be able to deliver that product. And very often, the delivering of the product is not entirely in your hands. We've seen considerable disruptions after disasters and pandemics and whatnot. In the slides I put up on the website, uh, and on Moodle, you'll see a picture of a huge number of ships which are waiting off the port of Newcastle in Sydney, near Sydney, Australia. And what are those ships? 
those are ships that are just simply waiting their turn to come into the port to upload product. And at one point there, there were over 100 ships waiting off the port of Newcastle. What was this about? It was about a dramatic increase in demand for coal from Australia, Sikitan, um, from China. Now, there were ships, there were customers wanting the coal, there were coal mines happy to export the coal, but the infrastructure, which we talked about, talked about earlier uh, in this week's modules, had not grown um, quick enough to accommodate the increase in demand for the product. And so there were ships that were sitting there at anchor literally for weeks, just simply waiting for their turn to be able to come in and load up with the product. And we see this in so many areas that actually companies who have customers who are ready to, to pay the company for their product, nonetheless can go bankrupt for the simple reason that they cannot get some basic inputs to actually produce their product. We've seen this uh, with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, that it's incredibly difficult to get some basic components to do online uh, videos, video capture cards, uh, good mics. Even if you can buy the mic, you can't get the specialized cable that can connect the mic to the computer, for example. People are waiting for weeks, literally, to be able to get some basic equipment in order to produce the product for the waiting customers, that is the students. It took me three weeks to get a cable for 1700 yen um, from the uh, mic manufacturer Rode just simply to connect it to my computer for instance. So a successful business has got to offer a means of effective production, okay, they need the technologies, the equipment, they've got to manage the human resources. Nothing kills a restaurant quicker than um, mistreating the chef who suddenly quits on you. That great Japanese expression, totaka, sudden cancellation, okay? Um, if people don't show up for work and a restaurant can't take enough orders uh, quick enough or can't get the food out quick enough, it's going to lose a lot of customers. And they won't come back, especially if it was an important event that they were celebrating, for example, at a restaurant. So you've got to be able to produce the product. You've got to be able to produce it at a price which customers will pay. And this means that when you've got those supply problems, if you suddenly find shortages and you have to pay a lot more than you expected, then you can run into financial difficulties very, very quickly. And longer term projects are particularly dangerous because you might quote uh, to a client a certain price, say for building a building, and then suddenly you find there are supply side problems and your costs rise dramatically, but you can't just turn around to the client and say, sorry, it's gonna cost you 30% more because the labor cost or the concrete cost or the delivery costs that I'm paying have gone up. Um, if you're routinely selling a product day to day, something like ramen, you can adjust your prices as need be. But in longer term projects with long delivery times, you can break your business by failing to anticipate uh, a lot of those supply side problems. And people, particularly sales staff, are always keen to, uh, to lock the clients in and they're often tempted to go cheap early to just win the business and then later on companies discover that they can't afford to actually deliver the product at the price that they promised. And then they have an invidious position of either simply defaulting on the contract to the company and paying compensation or delivering the product uh, effectively at a loss in order to maintain their reputation. Even if you can deliver it at a profit, uh, ultimately it may not be a good business to do because first of all you have to think about the cost of capital. Of course, now the return on putting money in a bank is very low, but even 10 years ago, you could put money in a term deposit in a bank, teki okin in Japanese, and you could earn 5% uh, just by putting the money in the bank and it was safe. So any business that you did 
had to earn a rather higher return than 5%, particularly to consider uh, the risk. And then there's opportunity costs. Now, you will be given so many job offers, and I see many students get themselves in trouble. They've got a part-time job. Their boss at the part-time job loves their work, wants them to work every day. Um, great for the company, often very bad for you. You have to make hard-headed judgments about, is this the best use of my time? And of course, we have this so often in life. You know, when I was a university student, I was working uh, as a photographer part-time. I also had another part-time job that was interesting. But uh, at some point, I had to make a decision about my study versus the, uh, the photography work, which I enjoyed, for example. And I could have done that as a career. The, there were some interesting uh, opportunities presented to me, but I decided to go in a different direction. So, of course, talented people, and I'm not saying I was talented, but talented people like yourselves will have many opportunities. And you have to simply ask, what will you sacrifice in order to pursue this? So this opportunity cost, what are you sacrificing in order to do this particular job or undertake this particular business? So all of those things weigh up on whether you will do a particular business or not. This, of course, leads many companies uh, who have scarce capital um, and uh, scarce human resources to make decisions to not pursue certain business opportunities that would nonetheless be profitable. So, in fact, many of the gaps in the market are not there because big companies didn't see them. It's just not worth their while. They choose strategically to focus their energies on other opportunities leaving many business opportunities for different kinds of companies uh, with different incentives. So we talk in finance terms about risk-adjusted return. So we recognized that um, a decision to invest in a business has to be uh, based on the expected return. What profits do you expect to come from doing this? considering all risk and the costs of managing that risk. What we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic is that some risks are not as obvious, as knowable as we may have imagined, and people can get caught out very badly as a result. And of course, for society to get what it wants from business, uh, it has to recognize that uh, there have to be rewards that if it's just not profitable to offer a certain service, people will get out of the business. And so this is an ongoing issue in terms of government policy. Sometimes when government tries to promote competition, it goes too far and it finds that no one can make a, a profit delivering a, a product at a certain price, maybe that the government thinks is a fair price. And as a consequence, people start to leave the market and that leads to shortages. We've seen this problem in Japan with the regulation of a range of medical services and care services, for example, Kaigo, um, home care nursing. The schedule of fees that the government set made it very difficult for private providers to deliver certain kinds of services. And so as a consequence, there's a shortage. Similarly with childcare, there's a shortage in Japan. One of the major reasons for childcare shortage is just simply that the salaries paid to childcare workers are not very high. So there are shortages of people. And if you don't have the staff, you can't open a childcare center. And a lot of that comes down to how much is the government prepared to allow companies to charge to provide a particular service in an industry. You know, it's often said that there would be absolutely no shortage of home care workers or childcare workers if you just increase the salary by 50%. So shortages are very often directly related to price and what are people prepared to pay. Of course, other people flippantly say, well, yeah, but if it's too expensive, I can't afford to pay it. But often there are big companies or there are governments uh, who are in effect customers for a lot of these services because they bear some of the costs for citizens or for their employees, for example. 
So it's very much a national conversation on a lot of these issues where ostensibly shortages are causing large social problems. Finally, um, if you're going to get into business uh, as, and present yourself an expert, make sure you have that expertise. In the Daily Dodgy number two, in the final set of slides here, there is this really painful pe um, picture of some guys who their specialization was moving pianos, but they dropped a very expensive piano in the mud, in a field in England, um, before a uh, very famous um, outdoor classical music concert that happens. And unfortunately, there was someone where, there with a camera at the time um, who happened to catch them and happened to cap them, catch uh, their brand on the side of the truck as well, which is all rather awkward. So, of course, one of the, uh, the lessons here is if you're going to make a mess of something, it's always better to not make a mess publicly because your reputation is so much um, at stake as a consequence. I hope uh, my comments here have helped to illuminate the foundations for successful business. I do sense at one point the lighting went a little bit strange. You were maybe briefly in the dark, or I was in the dark, and therefore you're in the dark. I'm sorry about that. But to do a complete retake on this uh, is a bit of a trial. So bear with me. Um, as you can see, um, I'm no expert on video production, and uh, it's... Um, uh, the, my lonesome crew of one, uh, I am cameraman, lighting man, editor, and uh, unfortunately the uh, talent as well in front of the camera, if only, if only there was some talent. Okay, uh, I look forward to bringing you hopefully some better quality modules um, next week for week three, and I'll update you further on that. Thank you.